Hi, I'm Cressel Anderson. This is Maker Size. In this episode, I make the rotating head for the Shaper project. The first step is to turn down that arbor that I used last time for casting the protractor disc uh, down to a consistent diameter so that I can cast the rotating head onto this arbor. And the arbor will remain in place attached to the rotating head this time around but I still need more area to mount the pattern on. Again, I use some silicon carbide abrasive paper to lightly polish the surface of this arbor. I took it over to the shaper and checked to make sure I had the proper clearance on the front of the protractor disc for mounting the rotating head. Need 36 millimeters past the front face of the protractor disc to mount the rotating head and I just don't have it so I'm gonna have to take the part back over to the lathe put the dog on the other end and clean up the end. I did that turning work off camera but once it was down to diameter across the full length of the arbor, I took it out of the lathe, removed the lathe dog, and then went back over to the shaper to test fit. Now that I had plenty of room across the length of that uniform diameter arbor, I went ahead and marked where the front of that pattern should be when I cast it onto the arbor. Then it was over to the hot wire cutter to start cutting the parts that I'll need to assemble the pattern. I use the hot wire cutter to roughly shape the outside, but I also detach the hot wire from the spring and then thread it through the internal holes on these pattern pieces. Throughout the process, I'm kind of constantly aware of the fact that these patterns, these styrofoam facsimiles, are a representation of what will become aluminum. So I can check it, verify it with uh, actual assembly to make sure that it is the part that I ultimately want to cast. There will be some shrinkage uh, between the styrofoam and the finished aluminum part, but largely these are high accuracy representations of what will be cast in the end. So I had a little bit of a problem. My pattern, I thought it looked a little tall, so I took it over and put it on the lathe. And when I twisted it around, I could tell that the top of the uh, tunnel that supports the down feed slideways, I could tell that that was going to be running into the lathe bed. I had a missing dimension on my drawings. And then that missing dimension, I'm not exactly sure how I supplemented it, but uh, pretty much the dimension that I hand sketched in there puts this part too far away from the axis of this arbor that I turned and uh, I kind of had to remake it. So I pretty much was able to salvage a couple pieces here of the original pattern, but I did have to remake the tunnel part. So I'm going to finish assembling it and put it in refractory and get started casting. As you've seen me do in many of my previous videos where I use the lost foam casting technique, I coat the polystyrene pattern with plaster of Paris and then I use sand to fill in any large voids. Then I further encase that sand with plaster of Paris. I let it dry overnight to make sure any moisture has had time to evaporate out of that refractory coating. And then I can embed it in sand. And I use a vibratory table to help make sure the sand flows into all the little voids and things around the outside of the pattern to give it good support. I weigh out the appropriate amount of aluminum and Fusion 360 is really nice because if I model it, I know how much it should weigh in aluminum. So I just, I think I usually use about 500 grams extra just as some allowance above what the calculated value is for the part. I load that into the crucible, melt it down, and then I can pour that into the riser cup 
and let it decompose that styrofoam and fill the void left by the decomposing styrofoam. Now at face value, this pour seems like what I'm looking for when I'm doing a lost foam casting. I want to see a nice slow pour of the metal, no turbulence in the molten aluminum. I want to see it flow nicely into the polystyrene pattern and then kind of cut it off without a lot of overflow or turbulence in the metal. Unfortunately, however, this pattern didn't turn out. Darn it. This pour failed for one reason, and it was an entrapment of gas. It was that I poured the metal uh, where it was too cool to effectively fill the mold. The metal flowed down from the riser through the feed gate and filled the mold, but that arbor that's in the center of the pattern acted like a chill. So it cooled the metal even more, and it just didn't have enough thermal inertia to really flow well into the top part of the pattern. The second time around I made the pattern and I mounted it upside down on the arbor so that the channel for the downfeed screw was at the bottom of the pattern effectively. That my thought was would allow the metal to fill that bottom part before it got to the chill. The second time around I had a entirely different problem that manifested during the pour, and that was that I had too much moisture content in my refractory. I was ready to go ahead and cast this part a second time, and I didn't allow enough time for that refractory to dry. So the moisture that was trapped in it kind of boiled off during the pour, and you can see that distorting and wiggling the pool of molten metal at the top. And uh, that's not a good thing for the casting, but in the end, the casting turned out usable, so I, I proceeded with it. But these are things that I'll integrate to help me make better castings. And I hope you can also integrate this information to improve your casting success when using the lost foam casting method. Looks like it might have worked. After I cut off the sprue and runner, I was able to take that arbor over and put the lathe dog on it, mount it up between centers and get started facing it off. And there's plenty of space to work on this side of the part. But when I flip it around to face off the front side as it's gonna mount on the shaper, there's really not a lot of room. That tail stock is extended about as far out as it can go, and, and I really had trouble getting up and making this the cut on this surface. These indexable high-speed steel insert tooling really facilitated this cut. I'll leave a link down in the description if you're wondering what they are, if you want to check them out. They're pretty handy for that kind of tight space, and they take out some of the variability associated with grinding your own high-speed tooling. I took the part over to the shaper to mark where a little recess needs to go on the arbor. This recess is so that a clamp bolt that goes through the top of the ram cap won't mar up the arbor. The next thing I did was I went ahead and reduced that end that sticks out past the front of the rotating head and then I went ahead and cut it off with a hacksaw and I ground down the little remaining nub with my Dremel tool. And this is so that I won't have to sand or scrape as much of that bearing surface to mate with the downfeed slide ways. I did a little bit more cleanup of the casting on the sander and I smeared on some Prussian blue oil paint onto my surface plate and I took the casting over and I marked it in as usual, I'm trying to get a surface flat, uh, just to kind of give me a characterization of how that surface looks. And you can tell there's some high spots left uh, from the operation on the lathe. I used a piece of 150 grit abrasive paper. This is just aluminum oxide abrasive paper. And you can tell that uh, when put on top of the surface plate, that gets it in pretty close to flat. I finished it out by scraping down the high spots 
and got a fairly nice pattern. Now this is what I'll be using and proceeding with when I mount the down feed slideways. I cut that from a piece of cold rolled steel to length. This is the part that mounts on the front of the rotating head. I removed the bolts that attach the ram cap to the ram and then I took the ram cap over to the drill press. I drilled it and tapped it for a 10 millimeter fastener and then I reinstalled those ram cap bolts and installed the rotating head lock bolt into the top of the ram cap. When I tighten down this bolt, as I mentioned earlier, it allows me to fix the angle of the rotating head in the shaper. With the lock bolt installed, I moved on to attaching the down feed slideways to the rotating head. And I do this pretty much in the same fashion that you've seen me do with many of these other assemblies. I install a single fastener and then align the part with its mating piece and then I lock it into place with a C-clamp. I then go back over to the drill press and I do another series of drill tap countersink operations to install that opposite fastener. Once I have fasteners at either end of the assembly, I can go back and repeat that same series of operations uh, for the remaining fasteners. And that's exactly what I did in this case. It gets six fasteners. And with that, the rotating head is complete. Now I'll move on to the down feed. And you'll probably see that in the next video. Unless I make some lathe upgrades between now and then. Thanks for watching.